Okay. So um, let's go through the problem of the day. And uh, again, we, we've been in this issue, this world of sorting and uh, you know sorting algorithms and applications of sorting algorithms. And uh, the problem of today is give an efficient algorithm to determine whether two sets are disjoint. Is this the problem of the day? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Analyze your algorithm in terms of m and n. So one of these sets is going to be bigger than the other. In particular, there is one set of size m and one set of size n, and this one is much bigger than the other one, right, potentially. Any questions about that? And we're given two sets, and we want to figure out whether they are disjoint, meaning that they have no elements in common. So if the sets were 1, 2, and 3 through a billion, these sets are disjoint. If I stick a, a 17 in here, they're no longer disjoint. Does everybody agree? OK, how can we do this? Let's say that this set here, the small one, we'll call S. The big one, we will call T. OK? How can we do this? OK, yes. OK, so what you're telling me is you're saying your algorithm is basically build a binary search tree on S, OK? And then for i equals 1 to n, search for you know, uh, t sub i in uh, S. Is, everybody, is that basically correct? OK. And if we're going to do the, so what is the time complexity of this thing? This thing will run, how long will it take to build the binary search tree on S? Well, first of all, let's, let's do it on this one, and maybe there's other ways of doing it. But what is the way of doing it? Well, how much does it, time does it take to build the binary search tree on S? OK, well, not S. This is the names. These are the sizes. OK? So the claim would be it's m log m. Does everybody agree with that? Because I'm going to be doing each insertion. is going to be it's only going to be at most m things. This is going to be m log m. Now, how much time will the search take? There's going to be n calls log what? M, it was better when I had better hearing. But right, that would be good. Does everybody agree that it's going to be this plus this is the cost of that algorithm? Is there any other way to do it? OK, yes? So you want to sort both of them. So that's going to be sort um, S, sort T. Compare the heads of the list. Are they the same? Throw away the smaller one. Right. Does everybody understand the algorithm that he's doing it? This is like a merging algorithm, right? Given two lists, he's merging them in. How much time would that take to do the merging? Then he's going to do the, uh, essentially the merging of the list. OK? How much time will it take to merge if you have one list of size m and one list of size n? How much time would that merging take? N. He says n. OK. I would like to say that it's order n plus m to be a little pedantic about it. Why? What's his merging step going to be? Compare the head, compare the head, toss one of them out, right? Compare the head, compare the new head, toss one of them out. How many elements ultimately get tossed out? n plus m minus 2, I guess, or something like that, right? So my claim is that the merging step here is going to take n plus m time. Does, does everybody see that? This is important because I'm going to talk about merge sort today, and I'd like to not say this again. Does everybody see that if I have two sorted lists and I want to look for a duplicate, 
If I throw out, if I have two elements that are different, if I throw, uh, I throw out the smaller, maybe a bigger one lies behind it, right? If, on the other hand, um, they are both the same, then I say they're not, you know, they're, they're not disjoint, right? Okay. What is the time complexity of this total algorithm? What's the time it takes to sort S? S log S. Not S log S. What is it going to be to sort S? M log M. What's it take to sort T? N log N. Okay? And that's the sort of this way to do it. Is there any other way to do it? Okay? Or does that exhaust everybody's ways of doing it? Let's see you. Okay, so what you're trying to do is you want to say build a hash table. Okay? So you want to hash which one in? Let's say you want to hash, build a hash table on what? S or T? Uh, the, the larger one? So you want to hash T. Well, you build a hash table on. Let's just say you, you, you're going to build a hash table. A, a, you're going to build a reasonably designed hash table on the, fir, the larger one. That's what you're telling me, basically, right? And then what you're going to do is for i equals 1 to n, what are we going to do? We are going to go and do search for s sub i in h. Does everybody agree with that? OK. How much time should it take to build the hash table here? This should be order n. Actually, wait, no, t. Oh, wait, we're going to look for which ones? We're looking for S. So this is order going from 1 to M, right? Not N, right? Be inserting M. We're going to be inserting S is the bigger one. So it took order N time to build the bigger hash table. Then for each of the smaller elements, we're going to look it up. How much time should that take? In principle, we're doing M things, each of which should take constant time, right? So you want to say that this is going to be order n, and these are sort of not worst case. These are sort of expected, right? Does everybody agree with that? So in linear time, he can do this. He can do this in linear expected time in n. Okay. Is there any other way to do this? Yeah. Nested search, we compare all of them. I don't know what that means exactly. Uh, well, uh, what else there? Uh, if you look at the first one, you compare it to every level, second level, and what you get the second one, compared to every level, second level. Did you start by sorting them? No, I just start by sorting them. OK. So one possibility that you're saying is without sorting, here's another argument of what you might be saying, is without sorting, what we could do is for i equals 1 through, um, through n, what's a smaller one? m, look, uh, what I would say, uh, s sub i in an unsorted array, right? You couldn't maybe not have sorted one of these. Does everybody agree with that? And then now for every one of these m elements, you're going to make a sweep through the array. That's one possibility. But that one should be something that's order mn, OK, in time complexity. People see what I'm doing? If I change this search to an unsorted array, that may or may not be what you were doing. But that's what I'm, I'm doing. Any other ways people want to vouch for? Yeah? You want to use a bit vector like idea, OK? So that, what he's suggesting is what if I build a bit, what if I know that the largest number in S and X was Q? 
He's going to build, if these were integers, he wants to build a bit vector that goes from 1 to Q. OK? And then search through this. The trouble is, this is not going to depend on the size of M, S, or T. This will depend upon the, the size of the biggest number, right? So if I take all of the numbers in this array and I multiply them by a million, your algorithm here will take a million times more, where none of the al other algorithms are affected, right? How many people see what I just said and why that is? So that's why I don't really like this idea, OK? We agree it could be done, but, uh, but I don't like these ones that, you know, I mean, sometimes, if you know the numbers are small, sometimes it pays. But I didn't tell you the numbers are small. Any questions? OK, so what are we going to do? Which of these is best? OK? This one here is m log m plus n log m. This is m plus n log m. Does everybody agree with that? What is this one going to be? This is going to be basically n log m plus m, m log m plus n log n plus order n. What is that going to work out to? Yeah? It's going to take longer because. No, no, no. What is the complexity? Can anyone simplify so the complexity of this thing? n log n plus m log m. Because n log n, you're claiming that. That drops out. That this is asymptotically n log n plus m is less than n log n and less than m log m. Yes, so the sums are less because m log m would drop out the m. Well, let's think what drops out here. One way to replace this is what if I have it as, let's just get rid of the big O just to make this simpler. n plus m. Does everybody see that really what I'm adding is m log m? plus n log n plus n plus m, right? And does everybody agree that n plus times log n dominates n, right? So we can blow that away. m is dominated by m log m, right? So we can blow that away. Are we done? Or is there, can we simplify this further? I claim we can simplify this further. Why? We know that n is always larger than m. Does everybody agree with that? So if n is always larger than m, the sum of n log n plus m log m is always going to be less than or equal to twice the bigger term. Does everybody see that? We are promising that n is always greater than or equal to m, right? So my claim is that n log n has got to be bigger than m log m. And therefore, the sum of these two is going to be less than twice n log n, meaning big O of n log n. I claim that the m terms can be dropped. How many people see that? How many people don't see it and want to? OK. Uh, not seeing any motion I can ascribe to that. So this is what I'm saying that is over here, right? Could we do that trick over here, by the way? We have an m plus n. Is there any trick that we can do here? What should this be replaced by? What? Could be 2n times log m which the 2 is wiped out by the big O, right? So this is really an algorithm that's going to be n log m. Does everybody agree with that? OK. Order nm, we agree, looks worse than both of these algorithms, right? So who's in last place? Well, this guy, was, this guy came up lame before we finished, right? This was the, lo this was the one in last place, right? Which of these two is better? The one on this side is right. In particular, if m is so small that it's only one or two, note that this becomes a linear time algorithm here, right? 
So in the worst case, this one is the champion. Now in practice, however, the hashing solution is the champion. Does everybody see that? The hashing solution is going to be basically order n. Expected. Okay? So this is why hashing is a good thing, okay, in practice. It is not a good thing on my exams unless I tell you I want an exp unless I explicitly allow hashing or I say expected. That's not a good excuse. Does everybody kind of get that idea? Yeah. Okay, so should you simplify things? You should try to simplify it as much as is accurate, okay? I mean, I don't, you know, so if you can, simplify it, okay? I mean, what I'm going to do on an exam, I don't know, okay? But, uh, but, but, you know, in principle, do you see at the very least it's clearer and you can make sense of it once it's simplified, right? The other thing wasn't wrong in the same way that saying the algorithm was big O of n squared wasn't wrong. Right? But it just wasn't as good an analysis as we would like. Any questions? Yes? Why do we say that the expected case of, um, what you call it, of this al why this algorithm is order n expected time rather than worst case time? The reason is, if you had gotten very, very unlucky with your hash function, what would have happened? You're hashing n names into it, and every single one would hash to bucket 1. And now you've got a long linked list of, one item, of all items in one bucket. Your hashing has done you nothing more than put it in a linked list. Does everybody see that? And now searching the linked list. For every item, is it in there? Bop, 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 bop. You've got to go to the end of the list. So if if you had been unlucky and your hashing thing threw everything in all the elements in the same bucket, your algorithm would have become n times m. Okay, yes? Isn't that assuming we can't make a perfect hashing function for the definition? Okay, so, so then there's now weasel words about hashing, using the word perfect hashing and stuff like this. So the, the world of what you can do with hashing is a complicated world, okay? And in practice, I give you that hashing is a good thing to do, okay? In practice, hashing is the right way to solve this, okay? If you're trying to prove that an algorithm problem can be solved in a particular amount of time, hashing is, you know, is not the way to give you the worst case guarantee, okay? So there's a lot of weasel words associated with hashing that I don't want to go into here, okay? There's different, a lot of different hashing techniques and all this kind of stuff. But the, the, the what do I put away, the way I put away this thing is, in the worst case, you can get very unlucky with a hash table. So in the worst case, hashing doesn't help you. That's why God invented bi ba balanced binary search tree. Any questions about it? OK. Again, but again, it's good to think both ways. Practically, hashing is a good thing, OK? You go to a job, and the first thing you do when given a task like this, if you tell the boss, I've got to implement the balanced binary search tree, the boss should fire you, OK? OK? But for a, for a worst case algorithm analysis, to make sure you understand how these data structures work, it's important to me we think about worst case stuff. Any questions? OK? Does that, does that satisfy you enough? No, no, we, we, worst cases of ha hashing is a randomized, we'll talk about randomized algorithms today. The guarantees that hashing typically gives you are randomized guarantees, okay? This guy was mumbling something about, oh, if it was a prime in my hash table and stuff like that. Basically, these guarantees come from picking the hash table size randomly. And then, usually, everything should be fine, okay? But in the worst case, Actually, perfect hashing, to be precise, perfect hashing is something that can give, give you guaranteed work, constant time lookup, but it can take a long time to find one of these perfect hash functions, okay? And it takes longer to build the table than, than we have talked about. That's really the weasel words associated with, with, with perfect hashing. 
Any questions? If you care about that, read more, but I don't really want to talk about it. But yes? So would that just be considering an incorrect answer for this question? Is it just asking for an efficient algorithm? If I ask for an efficient algorithm, I want you to, for now, write down that says I am looking at worst case. Recognize that I mean worst case unless I say otherwise. If somebody then comes in and, and says, no, 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 here's a randomized algorithm for it, OK, I will probably give them something for it. But often they're dodging the complexity of it because hashing makes a lot of things. Anyway, that, that's the principle in here. In general, unless I, I, I'm going to assume we, I want a worst case guarantee unless I tell you otherwise. Yes? OK, so right. So in this case, uh, I'm assuming that the sets have keys. So you're right. These are, it's important that in these cases that the sets be able to be, you be able to have a total order on the object. That's what it means to be sorted, right? How do you pair up socks? Does anybody ever have this problem where, they're, where they have, have socks coming out of a dryer? And you have you know, uh, all these socks, and you want to pair them up? What is the algorithm that you do for this thing? You randomly select two. You randomly select OK, if all your socks are the same, you just, just pull them out in pairs, right? But if they're different, what do you do? Ideally, if you could sort your socks by some order based on you know, which is your favorite sock to your least favorite sock, then the two pairs are going to be next to each other, right? But in general, for socks, maybe there is something that there isn't the total order on them, right? That's why you have to do a quadratic time algorithm in general, pairing these things up. OK, that's, I guess, what the question you're asking about is, right? OK, any questions? Yes? Uh, in theory, right, didn't you, didn't you already guarantee that uh, hash has a perfect uh, hash function if, if, if you have exactly uh, like n buckets for n, n inputs? So again, th there's a lot of weasel words and complexities about hashing. OK, so that's why I don't want to get two things. But generally, what is happening is the way we were doing hashing here was we came up with a hash function, and then we hashed the elements quickly with each hash, with the hash function, and hoped the hash function did, did the right thing. There might, there's another class of hashing algorithms that look at all your elements, look real hard at your elements, and then design a hash function that will do the right thing on exactly those elements. That is what we mean by perfect hashing, and that's kind of what I think you're sort of saying. That maybe there's a way I could analyze the elements and then perfectly throw them in the right bucket so there's never any collisions. Recognize finding these hash functions is a complicated business. Okay? And that's why we're not going to discuss it. And generally speaking, it can take longer, t more time than, uh, than, than we're talking about here. Any questions? Yes? For this one, the right thing to say is that the algorithm, well, OK, wait. I'm, I'm just uh, say the For this hashing one. So if you write this thing, if you, you tell me you decide, despite what I said, to use hashing on something. What should you say? You should say the worst case time of this was order nm, but the expected performance is order n. Now you tell me this, I can't really complain, right? You've, you, you've, you've done, I can complain there might have been a better worst case algorithm. But that's a, partial, that's a partial credit answer at the very least. Any questions? Yes? Should we do the same thing with pairing? Should we say with expected No, binary search trees, the thing, difference with binary search trees is I didn't go through the complicated delete and insert with rotations. But when you use an ABL tree, or a red-black tree, or a 2-3 tree, there are ways to force a, balanced, a, a binary search tree to be balanced over any set of operations. So there is no weasel words. I'm just saying, if you use a, 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 a tree that is designed to be balanced, then darn it, every one of those operations can take log n time. OK, it can be done in log n time always, regardless of the order in which you're giving these things. Any questions? OK, good. 
OK, so let's get into what I'd like to get into today, which are a couple of, uh, I'd like to polish up a couple more sorting algorithms. And in particular, um, the first one I'll claim we have largely done. Um, merge sort is a classic rec recursive divide and conquer kind of algorithm that works by partitioning elements into two sets, sorting them, and then merging them. So let me just see if I had this. Hold on. I wanted to claim I had a nice animation. Do I have an animation? OK. This is supposed to be the merge sort animation. What's happening? Look, we split it into pairs recursively. Split it into things recursively, right? Now, each of these eight lists is completely sorted. Is everybody, it's only got one element. It's got to be sorted. Now then we sort the smaller one. Now we sort its neighbor, right? Now we want to merge. Uh, OK, we're now going to sort all of these ones in this way that this is doing it. It's sorting it by levels. Does everybody see that? And then it's going to merge these two. See, it takes the head of them, puts it there. Compares the heads, puts it there. Now these guys have, have no head. One has no head anymore. Boom. Now here, we're going to take it. Pull that thing off. Two goes. Then four goes. Then seven and eight. Boom, boom. And now we're going to go merge these two again. Does everybody see that we had the lowest level, moved up to the highest level? OK. And now we do the merging. And what's, any questions about how this works? This is what merge sort is doing. Now, how much time does this algorithm take? OK, there, now we're done. You can cheer if you want for that thing. OK. So, what is the merge sort algorithm? Again, it's a neat recursive algorithm. Basically, so long as you have more than you know, one or two elements to sort, partition the array in the median, okay, at, at the middle element of the array. Sort the left half, sort the right half, and then merge them. And the important thing is we showed on the board a few minutes ago, merging two arrays takes time proportional to the number of the elements in that array. Merging two sorted arrays takes time proportional to the number of elements in that array. <coughs> Any questions about that? Yes? OK, so you said, what if we have an odd number of elements? So this thing beautifully divided it by two, by two, by two. Note that if you have an odd number of elements, one, is gonna have one, more, one half is going to have one more element than the other. Everybody agree with that? So they're almost the same. It's almost a perfect thing. But big O, OK, let's think about this, actually. There is a minor point here. We agree that if, if the n is the power 2 to the k, if n equals 2 to the k, how many levels of merging is there going to be? OK, K, does everybody see that we, there's one thing we split it, and now each, each, each half has half the number of elements? We split it again, it's got half as many elements, half as many elements, half as any elements. If n is equal to 2 to the k, what's the height of this tree? K. Now, how many of you wanted to say log n? OK. Why did you want to say log n? Because k is, in fact, equal to log n, isn't it? If you take a look at this thing, right? What was the log of something? It's the exponent that it takes to raise that thing to the power of this, right? OK, I'm getting some looks here, so I'm not sure I'm happy with this, OK? But what do we want to say? If we went through a tree where we split it, now we have pieces of size half. We split them in 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 their half. How many levels, if we start with n elements, how many halvings do we get till every element is by itself? How many? Log n. Does everybody see that? If n is equal to 2 to the k, does everybody see that k is, in fact, log n here, right? So if we have a perfect power of 2, this is a beautiful split. Everything is nice all the way around. But what happens if there is one less element? OK? Then one piece is going to be slightly bigger than the other, right? 
One piece is going to be slightly bigger than the other. What is, peg, what is the height of this tree going to be then? It's going to be the log of 2 to the k minus 1, which if you want to be an integer, you round it up. It's a ceiling. Maybe it adds 1 to the height or something like that. Big O wise, it isn't going to make a difference. OK? Any questions? OK? So what is the um, idea here? The big idea of merge sort, OK? In fact, this is one of your examples that isn't perfectly uh, a picture of something that isn't perfectly divided. But the thing that that animation should make clear to you is why merge sort is an n log n algorithm, OK? You should agree that kind of the tree, the height of the, what the tree is doing, divided, partition into two halves, partition this into two halves, partition. The height of this tree is clearly going to be log n, OK? Yeah, I'm using log n in a big O sense, right? How much work is being done at each level? This is the other thing that I want to count. If you remember what that animation was doing, it was taking a look at this and saying sorted, 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 sorted. Merge these two, merge these two, merge these two, merge, uh, first merge this two, then merge these, right? It merged from the bottom up. What is the total amount of merging being done on any level? Yeah? I, what I want to claim is, and this is the important point, if we sum up the work done on every level, it is going to be n amount of work, at most n comparisons. Why? Look at the top thing. We were merging a list of n over 2 elements and n over 2 elements. That cost how much? n over 2 plus n over 2 was n, right? In this case, we're merging n over 4 elements plus n over 4 elements. How much time did it take to create this, to merge these? n over 2. It took n over 2 to create this, right? What is n over 2 plus n over 2? n. In general, we have, on the i-th level, 2 to the i chunks, each of which is going to have n over 2 to the i things in it. Merging each one of those pieces takes time proportional to the number of elements in that piece. And the sum of all those pieces is n. Does everybody agree with that? So why is uh, merge sort n log n? The reason is because it is described by this tree of height n, and counting it by the amount of work done on each level of the tree, there is n comparisons done on each level of the tray. n times log n is n log n. Any questions about that? Any questions that we got a feel in your kishkas? Why is it that merge sort is n log n? Any questions? Now, notice when I'm doing that. Does everybody understand that? Let me now confuse you a little bit. Notice that merge sort did not work in the way that we analyzed it. When you did a recursive merge sort, what happened? You said, sort this. Then recursively call it, sort this by sorting this. Sort this by sorting this, right? Sort this by sorting this, then sort this, then merge this. Does everybody see that the, the, the order that the work is going on in merge sort? is like an in order, kind of like an in order traversal, right? It's going bop, bop, do something, do something, merge. Bop, do something, do something, merge. Merge. Bop, bop, do something, do something, merge. Do something, do something, do something, merge. Merge. Merge, merge. Does everybody kind of see that the flow of opera execution is not the way that we analyzed it? OK? I guess we used you know, some commutativity or associativity in our counting ideas, right? Any questions about that? Any questions about why merge sort is n log n? OK? 
So, good. So there are two things now I want to say about merge sort, and then I will move on to uh, something else. But uh, there's two things about merge sort now you have to understand, or that are useful to understand. One is that it is representative of a class of algorithms called divide and conquer. What was the way that merge sort worked? It said divide the data into two halves. Do something, solve the problem on the smaller halves, and stitch it together, right? Now, if the cost of stitching it together is less than the cost of solving the problem on the halves, this leads to an efficient way of, of, of an efficient kind of an algorithm. That's a general idea here. Okay? Now, um, usually, in, in, in a good algorithms class, you would have, this one isn't, okay? You would start out, perhaps, learning a lot about solving recurrence relations. How many people know what a recurrence relation is? Okay, most of you. If you took, I guess, AMS 301 combinatorics, you should know about recurrence relations, right? Recurrence relations are recursively defined equations. Okay? Like this one here, that the time it takes to sort n elements is the twice the time it takes to sort half the elements plus the time of merging a total of n elements, which is order n. Does everybody see that? So you can imagine a, a recursively defined equation called a recurrence relation. And in fact, this recurrence relation is describing exactly the time that merge sort should take, right? How much time should merge sort take? It's the time it takes to sort n elements by merge sort is the, twice the time it takes to sort n over 2 in the elements, the left half and the right half, plus spending n time for doing the merging. Does everybody see where this equation comes from? Or any questions about where this equation comes from? There are ways of solving these equations that would immediately from this pop out that t of n is equal to n log n. Okay? So one good technique sometimes for analyzing algorithms is to come up with the recursive, if it's a recursive algorithm, to come up with the recurrence relation governing its running time and then solving it um, by, by knowing how to solve recurrence relations. Okay, yes? Okay, so this should be an omega. So really this is saying that this is really is n. Okay? This should be give you this gives you an omega bound on uh, what what it's doing. Yes. Yes, because it's it's it all, each operation takes O one time, but you have to always do it n times with L S omega. So this it can't it don't really vary. Wait, no 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 no. So what I'm saying here is that sorting merge sort will in fact take uh, say to n, time, n log n time on every example. Okay, that may be what you're sa asking me about, right? Is there a good case for merge sort? Not especially. They're all going to basically do the same thing. Okay? Okay, any questions? But the point I was caring about is you should see that in principle, a recursive algorithm, it might be easy to describe its time complexity by a recursive formula. And if you are good at solving Recurrence relations, the analysis can pop out easily, okay? So if you're interested, read about recurrence relations, and that's sometimes a way to think about these things. I find that usually if you try to analyze it by drawing a picture of the tree and thinking about it, you can do anything a recurrence relation can do, but uh, that's up to you. Any questions? Yes? Yeah, uh, yeah, I would, uh, I would analyze recur uh, merge sort the other way. But for those of you who know about recurrence relations, and someday we'll take another algorithms course, you will see these kinds of things again. Any questions? Okay, good. So that's the one thing I want to teach you is it, it's an example of divide and conquer. The other thing just to tell you is why is there any reason why anyone in the universe would care about merge sort? 
It turns out that there is a good reason why in practice people use merge sort sometimes. And it has to do with the fact that, again, we assume in here, this class, we're comfortably assuming this RAM model where accessing memory at any point is the same, OK? But in the real world, there's these complicated caches. There are disks that spin around and take a lot of time. And if you want to sort really, really, really big things that don't fit in main memory, then it turns out that the algorithm that tends to work best is a variation on merge sort. Because it has something to do with how it sweeps through sorted lists in order. You know, kind of moving through a disk in order is a lot better than jumping in the middle of it. Because it takes time to jump in the middle of things. Okay? And merge sort tends to sweep things in order, okay, in nice ways. So, yes? Do you need double disk space for merge sort to work in an external or not? So, you need to have, w one thing that I'm, I have ever talking about is that with merge sort, you don't, ha you, you, when you merge things, you can't put them easily where they were before. You notice that if I have an array, Let's say I wanted to merge an array. Let's say I want to merge sort. I have the items 3, 4, 1, 2. And I want to merge these into a sorted array. I can't reuse the space that I'm doing now, right? I can't say, oh, 1 is less than 3. Let me put 1 over here. 2 is less than, than 4. Put two over here, because what's going to happen? Suddenly I've lost two of my elements. Does everybody see that? So you need to play games with external memory and extra memory and buffers and things like that. Okay? And, you know, so that's part of engineering a good merge sort. Okay? But uh, basic point, it should be clear it is n log n. It should be clear it might use a little bit extra memory. Okay, but still order n extra memory, so big O wise, not any extra change in space. Okay, and you can believe me that it's sometimes a good thing to do with sorting big files, which is what really people really care about. Any questions? Okay, good. Any other questions about merge sort? Okay, so the algorithm, the, the, Second sorting algorithm I'd like to talk about today is um, a, an algorithm called quicksort, okay, which is also sort of a divide and conquer algorithm, but it, it, it does the dividing in a different kind of way. Merge sort sort of split the array in half and sorted each half. What quicksort is going to do is pick one element, let's say the last element in the array, and use it as a, they call it a pivot element, and use it to partition the array into elements that are, uh, all the elements that are bigger than it are going to go to the right of the element in the array. All the elements that are less than it are going to go to the left of that element in the array, and it's going to sit in the right spot, okay? Any questions about that? OK? So the key idea here is we're going to go through, take our pivot. And there's a couple of different ways you can program it. But basically, we're going to keep boundaries of where all the elements that are less than the pivot versus greater than the pivot are. Is 17 less than the pivot? No, it's greater than it. So let's maybe, uh, is 5 less than it or greater than it? We'll swap them and move the walls in. My claim is that in linear time, give it a pivot element, and giving the element, the, the, the n elements that we have in our array, we can just move, put all the ones to the, that are less than it to the left, all the ones that are greater than it to the right, and it will slide into its right spot. Any questions about that? Now, I don't want to go through it, but has anybody, does everybody see how you can in principle, do that partitioning. Again, it's something, there's different ways you can implement it. But does everybody agree that you can do this in time proportional to the number of elements in the array? Is there anybody who says, I don't see how you can do that and want me to talk about it? Okay, good. So what is interesting about quicksort? 
Again, let's maybe take a look at a uh, Quicksort the movie. Okay, here's Quicksort the movie. Let's look at this thing go. Oops, that's our pivot element, right? We're now going to go and try to partition all the elements. Four is bigger than it. Six, now notice six and two are on the wrong side. So we're going to go and pop those things over, right? Now we move in. Five and seven, well, five is unhappy. Eight is happy. One is unhappy. Let's swap them, right? Boom, there they go. Okay, boom. Now what's cool about this now is that we can now independently sort what's to the left of the pivot. And none of neither one, one or two are on the right side where they belong, right? Now let's independently sort this and we'll quick sort the left side and boom, that came easy, right? Done, okay? Let's say it's done. Okay, again, there's some small cases it's doing here. But now, let's, now we're going to quick sort the right side. If that's our pivot element, now we're going to partition all these elements on this side. Who's bigger or less than the pivot? And the important thing to see here is that uh, it, the, the pivoting, the partitioning takes time proportional to the size of the array, so it's linear. And after we have done the pivot partitioning, all the elements to the left of the pivot can be sorted independently because all of them are less than the pivot. And they are all the elements less than the pivot. We can sort them independently of the guys in the le on the right side and there is no more merging that has to happen. Any questions? And voila, the thing is done. Okay, yes? Why is this better than deep sort? Why is it better? We don't deal in better here. We're just we're interested in what this thing is, okay? So bottom line is I can't give you a great reason why it's better than quick sort, than, than, uh, than um, Okay, so you said it's the fastest in track. Okay, so what I can tell you is this, okay? I'm gonna argue with you today that quick sort is gonna be an expected n log n. I can tell you that generations of computer programmers have implemented this thing and found that it runs two or three times faster than heap sort. Okay? And if you do complicated enough analysis, you can sort of see why. Okay, but that's outside the purview of what we're going to be doing in here. Okay, but it's the same sort of complexity, right? It's, so. As far as I'm concerned, one is expected n log n, and one is worst case n log n. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So what is important about quicksort? Okay? Again, the important thing with the pivoting is that it uh, gives us a way to decompose the problem into pieces. Okay? So let's, any questions about how quicksort works, okay? I've been a little bit quick about going through the algorithms. I want to spend the time on the analysis. How many people here feel they understand how quicksort works? How many people don't feel they understand how quicksort works? Okay, any particular question? Okay. Okay, the important thing to recognize is, let's just look at the algorithm recursively, because I did do it quickly. Basically, what is going to happen? We are going to sort a range of the array. The way we sort the range of the array is we pick a, a pivot element, partition the, that array to put the pivot element into a particular position, which is the position where it absolutely belongs, because all the elements less than or equal to it are to the left, all the elements greater than to it are to the right, at this point, we can independently sort the stuff elements to the left and sort the elements to the right, and we are done. Okay? Because any element less than the pivot is going to be here, and now this is all sorted. Any element greater than the pivot is going to be here, and it's now sorted, and the pivot is going to be sitting exactly where it belongs, right between them. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about quicksort? I don't mean to go through this too fast if this is a confusing thing. Yes? Which operation ensures that it's in the middle here? Which operation ensures that it's in the middle? Nothing is going to ensure that it's in the middle, but the question is what ensures that it's in the right place? Okay? What is going to ensure, if I, at the end when I pass back exams in this class, I'm going to have you guys sort yourselves by alphabetical order to make it easier for me to give back the exams. What's going to ensure that you're in the right place? 
If you are 56th in my roster alphabetically, why, when you sort yourself, will you be in the 56th place? Because there are 55 people who appear before you in alphabetical order, and there are n minus 56 people who appear after you, right? If I put you in your right spot and put all the elements before you, if I put all the people who are before you in alphabetical order before you, you will be in your right spot, correct? There's no guarantee that the pivot is in the middle. What the guarantee is that the pivot is in the right spot, right? If you happen to pick as your pivot the largest element in the array, the pivot is going to be at the very end, right side of the array. OK? Any questions about that? The important thing is to see that for correctness, the pivot is in the right spot, and the elements are put on the right side of the pivot, correct side of the pivot. OK? Any question? Meaning that the pivot is now really in the right spot. Yes? Well, where does the log come from? That's the analysis question I want to get into, OK? Now, what you're, the reason you're curious now is he said, oh, well, how do you guarantee it's in the middle? And you were saying, yeah, if it's in the middle, I know where the log comes from, right? Because every time I put something in the middle, I'm going to be having it, having it, having it. But there's no guarantee that I'm going to be having it, having it, having it, right? That's what the myth is, that's what the the issue is going to be. So let me go through this again a, a little bit more carefully. What would be the best case for quicksort? Now our dream would be that if we pick the pivot, what would be the ideal element if we got lucky to pick a pivot? What would we want that pivot element to be? In the middle, it's called the median, right? We want the median element to be the pivot, right? And what happens if the median element is the pivot? Well, then we end up with a tree of recursion that looks something like this. We, put the, we pick the median after we've spent linear time up top. Actually, I guess this is why they have to give me this, right? After they spent linear time, um, look at that. After they moved, spent linear time up here partitioning this, the median element happens to be what we picked as our pivot. These elements are less than the median. These elements are greater than or equal to the median. Boom. Now we can sort this recursively. And suppose every single time we, 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 we have perfect touch and always pick the median. Does every, what is the height of this tree going to be? OK. What is the height of this tree going to be? Log n. And why is it log n? Because log n is how many times we have it till it gets down to 1. Does everybody see that once we get down to something of size 1, again, I didn't divide it maybe four, small. Once it's down to size 1, there's no more work to be done, right? And that's when recurrent, the, the recurrence would, the call would pop up there, right? OK? But what is the important thing? If we, if we always pick the median, the height of our tree is going to be log n. Because we're going to divide it, each piece here is going to be size n over 2, n over 4, n over 8, dot, 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 till it got down to 1. The height will be log n. Does everybody see that? And what is the running time of that going to be in that perfect, beautiful case? Well, there's going to be here we have four parts, n over 4 elements. How much time is it going to take to do the partitioning of n over 4 elements? n over 4, right? Just the partitioning, right? n over 4 plus n over 4 plus n over 4 plus n over 4 was n. It's the same idea that we did with the merge sort, right? Here we have n over 2 elements and n over 2. The partitioning, the total partitioning, each level is going to be n. Do people see why the total partitioning at each level is going to be n? How many people see that? Maybe you don't see it. OK, no one will confess, OK? So this is, why is it n log n in the best case? In the best case, you see where that log is coming from, right? Does everybody see that? OK. And does everybody see where the n times it is coming from? Because that is the uh, total work per level. OK. Good. Now, what is the worst case? Suppose instead of being blessed to the point that you always pick a median as a pivot, 
You are cursed, and you always pick the largest element in the array as a pivot. Well, here you pick the smallest one. You spend order n times sorting going through these to, to partition them, only to discover that nobody is bigger than you, is smaller than you, right? Now you have spent order n work and gotten very little done, OK? Suppose you now try another pivot, and again you are horribly unlucky. The worst case would be that there's nobody gets off on the other side, right? What's the height of this tree going to be? N till we get down to a piece of size 1, right? If we peel off one element, one element, one element, only after we have gone through n levels here, n minus 1 levels, do we have one element left on the other side. So does everybody see that in the worst case, if we are unlucky about our pivot, what is going to happen? OK? What is going to happen is we're going to have a tree of height n. And the first n over 2 levels, we're going to have to scan through at least n over 2 elements okay, to do, in my course of doing my partitioning and learn to my distress that nobody goes to the left of me. Okay? Tree of height n times n steps, n, n times n, that is an n squared algorithm. How many people see why quicksort is worst case n squared? How many people don't see it? A question like I don't see it is a good question. Any questions? OK, good. So the tricky question and the interesting question is what, uh, why is it on average expected? Is quicksort going to do a good job? OK? And let me give you my intuition as to how, how I think about this. OK? Let's say that I have a job that's going to require N students to, to do, that, that, that's going to take, let's say I have a job that's going, to, that's going to take N hours of student time. Of student time. And I've got two N students in my class. N of them work, and N of them accomplish nothing. OK, they're lazy, they don't accomplish anything, worthless, OK? Does everybody see that if I gave my job, I broke my job into, into n pieces, I gave it to students at, uh, at random, half the time I gave it to a student, the student would do nothing, right? And half the time I gave it to them, they would get an hour, honest hour's worth of work done. Does everybody see that? How many people are following my story? OK, good. <coughs> now. Why would I get my work done? I take my job, break it into n pieces, give it to the first n students that came along. What would likely happen after a, an hour later? Okay, half of the students will have stared at it and done nothing. Half the students will have killed their halves, their pieces. Does everybody agree with that? And I say thank you very much, and I bring in another n over two students to work on the remaining pieces that weren't done, right? And I ask them, and half of them are going to get work done, and half of them aren't. How much time will it be till I get the whole job done? Does everybody see that if I gave it to, I had a total of two N students doing work, if half of them do nothing and half of them can do their job, if I give them two N, if the two N students, I will get the job done. Do people see that idea? Even though half of the students get, are worthless. Any questions? OK, now let's keep this in mind in the quicksort analogy. Let's say, think where I said worthless student. What I really mean is a pivot element that is not one of the n over 2 good pivot elements. Does everybody see that if the elements were sorted, Let's say that I'm going to say that a good pivot element is one that in sorted order would lie between n over 4 and 3n over 4. Let's say that a bad pivot element is one that lied either in the first n over 4 elements or the last n over 4 elements in sorted order. OK? Yes? I'm going to randomly pick one. Just like I randomly picked the, st pick the student, right? 
And there's a 50-50 chance it would come from the good region or the bad region. Does everybody see that? OK. So if I pick, if I pick them at random, half the time I'm going to get a good one, and half the time I'm going to get a bad one. Does everybody see that? Yeah. You're saying work hard to get a, be a, a, be a better one, to, to get a, a, go a better pivot, rather than leaving it to chance. And the answer is, I'm going to leave it to chance for now. OK? Because leaving it to chance is going to end up being just fine. OK? Why, OK? Why? Because again, big O, think about back to my good, bad student example. If I could have identified the n good students to do this n units of work, I would get it done in n steps. If I didn't know if half the students were good and half the students were bad, it took two n steps. Big O wise, is there a difference between n and 2n? No difference. Does everybody see that? So the interesting thing is you kind of see that what I'm going to claim is Let's think about good enough pivot elements as being ones that are in the middle half in sorted order. And by luck, I should be able to pick them half the time if I pick them randomly. Does everybody agree with that? OK. Now let's say that I always pick the worst possible good student when I pick a good student, and the worst possible bad student when I pick a bad student. It's clear the time it's going to take is going to get, be only worse than if I picked them randomly, right? I'd be better off with a pivot element here than a pivot element there. And I'd be better off with an element here than an element here. But let's say that I'm either going to pick the worst possible good element or the worst possible bad element each time. How many worst possible good elements do I need? OK. When I pick a worst possible good element, I will be dividing the thing into a, something of size 1 fourth and 3 fourths n. Does everybody see that? This piece is going to be 3 fourths n now, right? So what I really want to know, how many times, if I keep taking 3 fourths n, how many times could I take 3 fourths? If I take it, Worst possible pivot, I end up with 3 fourths of it. If I then take the worst possible good pivot then, it's going to be 3 fourths times 3 fourths will be the size of what's left. That's 3 fourths squared. If I keep doing it again, it'll be 3 fourths cubed, 3 fourths, till eventually, if I take enough levels, I will get that down to 1. That's when I would stop. Does everybody get an idea? What is the L such that? 3 fourths to the L is equal to a, times n is equal to 1. That's the same. By just multiplying both sides by 4 to the L and dividing it by 3 to the L, I get n equals 4 thirds to the L. What is L? L is basically the log base 4 thirds. Uh, OK, that, that basically what I'm going to be getting if I hit both sides with the log of n. This is going to be L times the log of 4 thirds. This is going to be log n. Basically, log of 4 thirds is a constant. This is telling me that the height of this thing is going to be log n. OK, any questions about it? OK, I mumbled. Can I repeat it? What I'd like to repeat about it is, Remember, at one point when I talked about the, prop the properties of logs, I said the base of the log doesn't matter in a big O sense? Dividing it perfectly in half is big O-wise no different than dividing it into 3 quarters. The number of steps is still going to be theta of log n. If I always divided it 99 one hundredths on one side and 1 one hundredths on the other side, it would still be log n, because the base of the log doesn't matter, big O wise. OK? And again, the point is, if you look at it, what is the height that I would need if I always divided it by 3 fourths? Then um, what I'm going to be telling you is it's going to be basically that the height here is going to be log n times a constant. OK? 
And so the height of this thing, the number of good enough partitions that I need is order log n, okay, to drive that big piece down. Any questions? So this tells me that if I built that tree, okay, <laughs> there's going to be a mix of good partitions, that was a good one, and bad ones, right? And as we go down to the tallest branch, ka-chunk, 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 it is going to have a mix of good and bad ones, right? The bad ones made no progress. The good ones divided it by, took at least a quarter of n off of it, right? right? There's going to be at most a log n good ones, and there should be, on average, as many good wa bad ones as good ones, right? I'm unusually unlucky if I have half of you are good students and half of you are bad students. And I pull half of the students over here and I got all the bad ones. Does everybody agree? So what's this saying? This is saying that I need a log n. The height of the tree is going to be log n. Good part, is going to be the number of good partitions plus bad partitions. The number of good partitions can't be more than theta log n. And the number of bad ones should be no more than the number of good ones. OK? So at log n plus log n is order log n. And that is my argument as to why, even if I, I can't get very unlucky, OK, this thing should run in n log n time. Any questions about that? OK? Any questions about this thing? Think about that argument a little bit. And I want to talk to you about it a little bit more at the beginning of class next time. Okay? But think about, see whether you come back and that convinces you that quicksort should be n log n. Okay, thanks a lot. I'll talk to you guys next class. Yes, let me get out of here.